Welcome to Silver Silk Gaming, my name is Lachlan Linton Keane and welcome to the third instalment of our Palinor Fields Terrain Series. Today we're going to be checking out the 4x4 foot board that forms the centre of the Palinor, directly behind the Ramesser Core that we saw built in parts 1 and 2. It's an awesome little board, we've got corpses everywhere, Rohan, Easterlings, Orcs, dead Mumakil, there's a little Orc camp and some really sexy LED filled fire trenches that may or may not be a smoke machine. Before we dive right in, a huge shout out to all of our Patreons. As I was building this board, I was constantly uploading photos to our Patreon Discord and it was really fun kind of getting feedback from everyone and they were hyping me up and keeping me motivated. So it's really nice to see that little community grow. If you'd like to be a part of that and kind of check out all of my builds as they're happening rather than having to wait, you know, sometimes quite a while in between videos, jump down into the description and head over to Patreon. You can find out all of the details over there. In the meantime, let's jump into the build. construction underway we need to work out the layout of our board. Now we've got a handful of key ingredients and depending on where exactly we position those on the board is going to really change how the board plays. I find the easiest way to break these kind of layout plannings down is to focus on the things that can't change. We know that our road has to enter up here in the top left hand corner so that gives us somewhere to begin and we know that the fire trenches and the orc camp are going to need to be over on this side of the board closest to Minas Tirith. And I guess a big concern for me, a big sort of focus for this board is to really uh, highlight that big central field. We want a nice big region where we can have lots of corpses, lots of dead Rohan action that doesn't get broken up too much. A big patch of Palenor fields. So uh, starting off with our road, I've decided to keep it running in a straight line. I, I did kind of tinker with the idea of curving it around and bringing it to the center in case I wanted to line up with some Minas Tirith gates later on, but I'm happy with those being offset down the track and also that allows us to kind of really keep that central field region for all our beautiful corpses. And then our uh, orc camps, I've decided to sort of sit those trenches in about six inches off the off the board edge here. So we've still got a little bit of space, um, but it once again kind of doesn't let them take over the center of the board uh, because once we get our orc camp in here, obviously all these little tents and things are just some uh, mock-ups for our positioning. The ones that kind of bleeds in, we don't want that to take up too much of that central region. Uh, the other important element we're going to have in here is uh, some little rocky outcrops uh, to, to kind of create some vertical difference. If we use the exact same technique as the, uh, the Ramesser core board, where we kind of really put lots of divots in with the heat gun and make it really undulating, it's going to be quite hard to glue down all of our corpses and uh, create our beautiful graveyard battlefield. So I'm going to do a little bit of that, kind of transition into this, and then we'll have a few kind of rocky outcrops and ridges that create some different elevations that can allow us still some kind of broad flat spaces that we can cover with our dead bodies. And then the final element is of course our incredible dead Mumakil, uh, which is just going to be a really fantastic addition to the board because it's big, it's chunky, it blocks line of sight, this is a really open board, so this is a great piece. We've actually got three of them, only one of them is going to be permanently stuck on the board and the other two we're going to have as dynamic in-game elements, but we've decided to chuck him up here in this kind of top right corner and, uh, and that way he kind of 
he he takes up a, a real feature of that quarter of the board and uh, he allows you know really great flow through this central region but is still part of that big beautiful kind of central field of death so an exciting looking layout and I think the very first thing we're going to dive into is having a look at our LED fire trenches and uh, once we've nailed all those down we can flow into the ore camp and start to flow into shaping the main surface of the board itself but for now let's go and check out some LEDs so I've seen a lot of different types of fire in various pieces of terrain from small campfires right up to like exploded vehicles and nothing's ever really grabbed me as an amazing fire piece. Uh, so for these fire trenches in front of the orc camps that we're going to do, uh, I wanted to try and create something really cool and really dynamic that tried to capture the really awesome essence and eye-catching power uh, that a big fire piece should have. So obviously the way to do that is LEDs. Now I've uh, kind of experimented with LEDs a little bit in the past but nothing in kind of a massive sort of build element so it was kind of breaking new ground for me uh, and basically the best thing to do when you're kind of exploring these new areas and new types of terrain techniques is to just do a whole lot of design uh, conceptually uh, as well as drawings and also just make a lot of prototypes and test things you're never going to get it right first go uh, so it's kind of just a big experiment and uh, embrace that process so essentially I distilled the design down into two separate elements you've got the flames themselves and then the illumination. Now we'll get into the flames in a second but essentially I knew that they were going to be a translucent material and uh, that I would essentially sculpt a set of flames that would then just drop straight down on top of an LED rig and the LED rig would be mounted recessed deep into the base almost right on the hardboard itself and we kind of have a channel that would form the trench uh, the LED rig will go down the bottom and then the flames would sit on top and then the trench would sort of flow down into that and we'd then cover that with rubble and ruined ash and all that kind of stuff. So uh, LED rig wise, I experimented with a lot of different LEDs and, and kind of played with all the different styles and colors and patterns and tried to kind of work out a different combination that created the most realistic type of fire. And the kind of thing that I learned, I guess, is that fire is really random, it's really chaotic. So that finding that balance between uh, the color and pattern of the strobing of the LEDs themselves and making sure that nothing feels like it's really uniform. Because it's, it's, you know, chaos theory, right? When, when fire is igniting, it's a totally random chemical reaction and we want to try and capture the spirit of that. So I ended up going with two different styles of LEDs flashing out of sequence with different styles of flashing patterns. One one of them red and one of them yellow. Uh, I, I did experiment with three essentially uh, and I ended up killing one and we'll have a look at why in a second. So the uh, two main elements are some strip LEDs. I got these from an LED supply shop, JCAR, here in Australia for like 20 bucks. Um, and these just do kind of a red pulse. It's not particularly random, uh, but it's sort of just, you know, like a gentle pulse which sort of fills the ready tones of the firelight itself. And then I just went for some Christmas lights, uh, which are, these are just fairy lights um, and uh, they were a bitch to find. Basically, I, we want that pattern, as you can see it doing here, where it's just constantly flickering and just constantly kind of with that ebb and flow, really random, there's no real obvious pattern. And, uh, and that is actually a really difficult sequence to find because we have all these different LED fairy light kits and they've all got the eight modes, you know, strobe, flash, fade, dissolve, whatever. And it took me nine different LED kits to find one that would do this pattern just as a single pattern on its own without then in 30 seconds automatically turning into a really bright flash, which of course didn't look natural at all. So I just, uh, I've bought, yeah, a whole bunch of different LED sets, ended up returning them, tested them in store where I could, and I ended up finding this one brand, uh, which I don't have on me. The brand is... So the brand is like, it's called North Pole Approved. Essentially, it's like a home brand for a local Christmas shop that we have here in Brisbane uh, that sell, you know, all sorts of Christmas supplies. And that's their own lighting stuff that they must import from China or whatever. Um, so it's, yeah, essentially, if you're looking for that kind of stuff, just experiment, try and find Christmas lights. Everyone's got different Christmas lights all over the world. I'm sure you guys will be able to find something that, that kind of captures that pattern. But yeah, what you want is you don't want stuff that has that really uniform flash. We have a little bit of it here in the red. As you can see, that's just doing a gentle pulse, uh, and but because it's so broken up by the fairy lights, it works quite well. Um, so as you can see, what I've done here is I've just mounted these in a piece of 
uh, just 25 millimeter PVC piping which I've cut in half, drilled a whole bunch of holes in and then mounted all my fairy lights and this has become the flame rig uh, and then that will be mounted on the base and we'll cut a big incision, mount it all in and go from there. So that's the LED rig coming along really nicely but before we start to mount it into the board and hack away those trenches we need to start having a look at our flames. So that is what we'll jump into next. So the second element is of course the flames themselves. Now I'm going to create those using some uh, kind of clear finish silicon. This is a crystal finish which is just by Sellys, but there's a bunch of brands that do it. Uh, it's essentially a silicon sealant that you use in plumbing or tiling, but it's uh, designed to dry completely clear. It starts pretty clear as well, which you can see, which is awesome because we need the medium of the flames to be transparent or at least kind of translucent so that they capture the flicker of those LEDs coming up through the LED rig. Uh, it's also a really friendly material to work with we can just squirt it out it comes in these corking tubes chuck it in the corking gun put a nozzle on it and just pull the trigger and it squishes out it's all soft and beautiful uh, and we can just kind of work it and shape it into those flame forms uh, and then about three hours it'll be fully cured uh, and then we can start to move it into the LED rig it's completely paintable which is really great for us because we're going to apply some uh, kind of yellow and orange inks as well to kind of bring in the color of those flames which will be really accentuated by the LED rigs and it's just really friendly to work with. The only danger that uh, it sort of does present is if you overwork it too much, you start to bring lots of bubbles in and you start to kind of uh, move more from transparent to translucent. So we'll try not to uh, kind of overwork the material. And the other thing is because of the three hour cure time, uh, gravity does kind of affect flames. I mean, it's not designed for sculpting flame sort of sculpts and forms. So what I'm going to do is uh, sculpt it all up and then I've got it mounted uh, onto this piece of timber here. I'm just sculpting straight onto a piece of transparent plastic and then once I've sculpted all my beautiful pointy flames I'll just flip that upside down and clamp it to the table and that way gravity will help the flames keep their shape rather than kind of getting a bit droopy and, and pointy. Uh, so let's just jump straight into it. It's, uh, it's really fun actually. Uh, so the first thing you want to do is just grab your corking gun and line up your plastic and just dump a whole bunch on there. We want to apply a reasonable amount of material because we've got to give ourselves kind of you know room to sort of sculpt you can really just get in there. So I apply kind of a, a big thick coat for the base and then you can just come on a bit more and, and dump it on the top and it will all just bond together pretty seamlessly which is really fantastic. Let's get a whole heap of material because we want those flames to be pretty tall. So now what I've got here is just a couple of different uh, tweezers actually because I can use the back of the tweezers as a sculpting tool and actually tweeze up some parts as well. So remember we don't want to overwork this but we just want to begin to really put those forms in. Now one trick you can use as well is just chuck a bit of water on the end of your sculpting tool because uh, that way the silicon is not going to stick to you or not stick to you as much. Just like when you're sculpting green stuff essentially. Now it starts to get a skin pretty quickly, so you want to try and get those sort of first pointy shapes pretty quick. So we want to make sure the sides aren't too smooth either, because you know there should be some little licks of fire coming from every direction. Don't just work the top, but the more you work it, the less translucent it will get. So it's it's all about that balance. As you're dragging from the left and from the right, sometimes it leaves a little skin in the uh, in the ridge of the fire. So make sure you kind of get in there and, and pull that up as well, because that center region of the flames, that should be quite pointy really. All right, I think that's looking pretty good. The other thing you can do is if you've kind of created a central column of flame and you're not sure how that's going to look, you can just leave it, let it cure, and then, you know, kind of add a few more bits of silicon around it to bulk it out and put more flames in. And that's probably what we'll end up doing, adding a few flames here and there as we sort of see it sitting through the LEDs and, and kind of taking it a few steps at a time. But I'm pretty happy with that as our initial flame. So I'm just going to leave that mounted upside down so the gravity can uh, do all the work for me and we get a beautiful flame shape as it cures. So 
So as you can see, our silicon has dried and we've got some really incredible flame shapes. Even though some of it's got a quite tall and spindly, it's pretty remarkable how much structural integrity it has. It doesn't look like it's going to fall or kind of curl over like some of the prototypes did. So I think, you know, hanging them upside down while they cure is absolutely imperative and it's worked a treat. They look really fantastic. They're so tall and dynamic, much better than these kind of shorter, stubbier prototypes. So I think they'll really help to capture the big sort of presence of the fire leaping up out of the trench because that's the other thing to consider too is these are being mounted down in trenches so to kind of really kind of get any uh, effect or presence on the battlefield from the flames they're going to need a bit of height so that is going to look fantastic now while that was curing I finished off our uh, LED rig uh, just kind of ripping up the tape and hot gluing all of our joins in place so that way everything is nice and solid and that's now ready to go in uh, now when we were doing our prototyping process for our flame bodies I made three different styles one was just a clear silicon one was clear silicon that I then painted with translucent sort of yellow and orange inks and then I did a third one which was uh, a combination of the two uh, and, and that kind of, kind of gave me an ability to just sort of see what different fire effects would look like before treating my final flames. Uh, as you can tell, it is really important to make sure you strap down those plastics as they're curing because look how bent that plastic is. Whereas our pieces are absolutely dead straight. They look fantastic. So um, I ended up deciding initially that I, I liked the pure uh, uh, kind of silicon with no paint. Uh, but as I built this final flame rig, the, the painted one just looks so much better. You get a whole lot more kind of body and color. Uh, and then the uh, the LED rig just gives the essence of the random fire-like behavior. Uh, so that's the way we're going to go, I think. But what we'll do is we'll slap our actual flame rigs on and, uh, and check out what those look like, because of course now we've got the real thing we can test. And the other kind of final piece for the flame rig and the color sort of ballpark itself is uh, this is a little bit of uh, color temperature orange film gel you could just as easily use cellophane uh, but what I've done is you just sort of slip that on the top and it it just kind of give really warms up the Christmas lights they're a bit more of a warm white than a big fiery yellow so this way they get a bit more of that tungsten kind of yellow color uh, and uh, that will give that fire a really nice glow. I'll show you the difference between. So if we leave that one there with the beautiful kind of orange and we chuck these on without, you can clearly see this is much warmer, much, you know, really nice firelight, firelight kind of flickering there. Uh, cool, all right, so that is looking great. Now let's just chuck all of these guys on and we'll have a bit of a look at how these shapes are catching the light. Wow, that looks absolutely stunning. The verticality really gives a lot more space for the refracting light to kind of flicker through. And, and I was worried that it might sort of only kind of glow around the bottom of the silicon, but it's coming right up to the tops of the flame. So that's looking fantastic. Uh, it still looks pretty kind of silicony and got that real gel look. So we're definitely going to paint it, I think. Uh, that will really give it that proper firelight body of color. But that is looking fantastic. So let's jump into painting it. So obviously when painting the flames, we want to make sure that they still stay pretty translucent and, and really capture the flicker of that LED. So I'm going to use some high flow acrylics. These are essentially just like the craft paint version of uh, a Games Workshop ink or wash. Uh, they're really high pigment concentration, but they've got a really high flow rate. So they're quite runny and, uh, and they can stay kind of really watery and translucent. And they're just normal water-based paints, which is the great thing about working with silicon. Uh, and uh, the other great thing about that is, is if we apply too much yellow or orange, we can always just get some water on the brush and just pull it straight back and, and get rid of it so it's a really friendly process uh, so the key I think is to mix uh, lots of yellow and orange together as we paint it and I'm kind of almost going to wet blend the flames as I paint them just you know not allowing each layer to dry but if we have a look at our prototype here uh, the the best kind of element is where the orange and yellow come together rather than big clumps of yellow or big clumps of orange all right, so let's grab our little brush here. So I've got my orange, my yellow, and some water. Uh, we'll start with this guy here on the right first. I think I'm gonna go with, we'll try a little bit of yellow, and I'm just gonna start with the tips. This is obviously a lot taller than our prototype, so there's a lot more to kind of paint, which is gonna be interesting to sort of see how it, how it behaves. About orange, I think. Now, obviously, the orange is a lot darker pigment, so you don't want to be too heavy handed, um, otherwise, it will kind of really overpower. 
So I'm just kind of lightly dragging it across the surface and then letting it kind of flow wherever it flows rather than really forcing it in anywhere. So we don't, we don't want any of this to look like brush strokes. Uh, we just want it to look like a you know really dynamic chemical reaction. <laughs> That might have been a little heavy handed there, I'll see if I can pull that back. Just take a bit of water onto the brush and then we can just wash back anything that's gotten a bit too strong. There we go, that's pushed it right back. A bit more orange. So obviously you just got to think about what fire looks like as you're painting. Uh, you know, kind of that yellower top up near the lick of the flame as, and, and that kind of deeper orange right around the base. Because uh, of course that is where it's hottest. Now that's looking good. I think I'll now just go back with a little bit of yellow and just blend some of that orange together to get more of a, uh, a washed orangey yellow between so that we don't have such a harsh separation of colour. And that way, this is essentially where the wet blending comes in, uh, where we just go and everywhere I've put a little bit of orange and yellow, I'll just blend the edges with the softer yellow. And now what we'll do, while it's still wet, we can sort of see uh, how the paint's behaving by chucking it straight onto our little LEDs. And that will give us a, an idea straight away of whether that kind of style of paint is working. So let's grab my LED rig here and, and bring it in. Oh, that looks awesome. That looks really good. Okay, so uh, we're getting lots of color coming up, lots of flicker. Um, is there anywhere else we want to chuck a bit more yellow? Maybe that in there looks a little too clear. I can just go in and, and push that back. Well, I think that's about as good as we're going to get. So, I will jump onto the other two flames and we'll smash these guys out and then we can have a look at the whole flame trench ready and painted. Alright, so now it's time to dig our trenches. Now I'm just going to take out a really huge piece of the board to give us plenty of room to install the LED rig and all of our flame bits uh, and then we'll come back with foam and putty and build the trenches back up and sculpt the actual trench that the orcs have dug out. Now what I'm going to do is I've sort of swapped the side that I'm going to put the trenches on and rotated the board 90 degrees so that I can have the trench going across uh, the join where I've got the two foam panels because with these thinner panels when you make a 4x4 four four board there's just a little bit too much flex in this centre join so just having you know these extra big long bits of PVC kind of really siliconed in there will just help uh, a bit of kind of strength I guess for the board in the direction that it's flexing. So just got a Stanley knife, nice and sharp, brand new blade because cutting this out could be a bit of a bitch, it has been glued right down and we're just going to slice, slice and slice and then get underneath and lift out all of these panels. So I'm just going to get into it. Oh wow, this is not going to be easy. <laughs> You can see quite clearly why using liquid nails is a complete waste of time when you're trying to glue down foam because it just dissolves the foam and doesn't bond with it. PVA, unfortunately, is the way of the future. Alright, so here's our little trench. We've got plenty of room for the lining rig to just drop straight in and there's enough space that we can really pick the perfect angle. I think we won't have the trenches in a straight line. We'll sort of make them a little bit offset and then the orc camp in behind there. They are orcs after all. They don't know how to dig in straight lines. I've left this little LED light not plugged into the main rig so that maybe I can turn that into a little orc campfire back here in the uh, in the orc camp itself. So that should be pretty cool. And uh, I guess it's coming along pretty well. We've got our lights, we've got our flames, but there just seems to be something missing. What else could we do? I mean, when there's fire, there's usually smoke. 
So in our quest to make the most realistic, awesome terrain wargaming fire ever, I thought, man, I'm already doing all this work in laying an LED rig, I might as well put some practical smoke in. We're digging up the whole board anyway to lay those trenches, so it gives us an opportunity to kind of run some sort of system in the board itself that can feed smoke up through the flames. So I had a bit of a think about it, and I settled on uh, a loose kind of design using some PVC conduit and some clear vinyl tubing. So essentially what we'll do is we'll pump the smoke from our beautiful little smoke machine smog here, and pump that through into this end. This end will be blocked and the only outlets are going to be these little uh, PVC tubes and then we can kind of position and glue these because they're quite flexible up into the base of our silicon fibers going over the LED rig and, uh, and then our smoke will come up through our flames. And I think that's going to look really awesome because uh, one of the key things with making smoke look good either sort of in person or on camera is that the flames and, and the smoke itself needs to be backlit. So as it comes up through the LEDs we should get a little bit of a kick of the color of the LEDs flashing in that in that smoke uh, as, it, as it sort of rises. So I think it's going to look pretty cool. Now, um, I've got a, a little bit of work to do. This is still just my prototype. Essentially, all I've done is drilled some holes in with my sort of 5 mil drill bit and then gone and uh, stuck my little PVC tubings in and then just hot glued them in and around. And this will work well for this side, but I was originally going to run one of these tubes on either side of the LED rig, but uh, I've done some testing and we don't really need to do that, I don't think. There's no kind of pressure issues or anything like that. I've built rain rigs for film in the past and you've got to make sure that, you know, the holes closest to the smoke are smaller and the holes further away are bigger. But the because the, it's a vapor and not a liquid, it's really great. It's really easy to work with. You just pump the whole tube full of smoke and it all comes out through all the holes really evenly, which is awesome. So what we're going to do is uh, mount one tube on one side of the LED rig and then I'm going to add a whole bunch of extra tubes which are longer and they'll go underneath the LED rig and come up on either side and that way we can have sort of smoke ports dotted all the way along the LED rig that come out either side. Now, before we move along, I should introduce you to Smaug officially. So this is our beautiful little uh, smoke machine. I just got this from like a production store, a DJ store, a lighting store. Uh, this cost me 35 bucks Australian. They are cheap as chips. They've got a little remote sensor. Woo! Uh, so they're really user friendly and this will just sit under the table uh, and then we will have this guy which is just a bit of a uh, homemade job this is just more clear irrigation tubing uh, a little 90 mil uh, adapter which goes onto my 20 mil conduit uh, and then this is just a really homemade adapter which just sits onto the nozzle itself uh, in the future I might try and improve this a little bit but I just wanted to get it working for today obviously the nozzle of Smaug uh, his, his maw, his gaping fire breathing maw gets incredibly hot uh, so you can't have anything like already I can start to see this plastic is melting so eventually I might upgrade to some steel connectors or maybe even I could use uh, gas piping or, or copper tubing or something that's a bit more uh, you know thermally, thermally resistant rather than uh, this guy which is eventually going to melt or catch fire but he'll do for today and for getting it working and then we can optimize that later alright so let's get you out of the way my friend and what I'm going to do next now is drill a whole bunch of extra holes. Uh, they can be in the exact same spot and then I just need to cut longer uh, longer tubing. So drill, it's not nothing too crazy. He says while the drill bit slides everywhere. There we go. Uh, try and keep them all uh, on the same axis. That'll just make sort of routing all your PVC piping a lot easier if it's all coming from the same angle. All right, see, super easy. Conduits are really lovely material to work with. Uh, and then what we want to do is just cut a whole bunch more uh, vinyl tubing. And this guy just needs to be long enough that he'll get around and up and under. So probably, honestly, that's probably even long enough. Um, we'll go about there. So probably six inches is probably a good length. I'll just go and cut a whole bunch of these. So then we just grab our hot glue, smash it on one end, make sure you get all the way around the tubing and then stick it into the hole because we are trying to make a seal uh, and, but just be careful that you don't accidentally cover up the tube itself with the hot glue otherwise you're not going to get any smoke coming out because it'll be blocked. Alright, so that's all our pieces in. We've got our short sides for one and the long sides for the other, which is looking pretty good and they're all sealed up with hot glue. So I'll just stick this into our little adapter here 
and uh, give you a test of what it looks like. So I've blocked the end with just a bit of tape for the time being. So the smoke's coming in, and as you can see, it's all coming out the conduit tubing. Look at that. Fantastic. Oh. Uh, yeah, that's going to look absolutely awesome. So now, let's get back over to the board, and we'll start to mount pieces in. So we've got our smoke rig and our LED rig and now we need to mount these guys in. What I'm going to do in terms of feeding into the smoke rig is I've got a little 90 degree bend here and then just an extra piece of conduit and that's going to run all the way to the end and then I'll just have that open and accessible from the side and I'll have a little sort of extra 90 degree plug which I'll then connect in which will be flush with the side of the board. Uh, so I'll have to cut a little bit of section of there, I'll mount this in first and then I'll mount that guy on top feeding all of the shorter tubes over the top and the longer tubes will go underneath and around. Now to glue this all down, I'm just going to use whoop, construction adhesive uh, and uh, make sure that I don't get it near the foam because it will dissolve the, uh, the extruded polystyrene, it will eat it away uh, and then I'll, I'll mount that all in it and because it's, it's an adhesive but it's also got a bit of volume, it will help kind of level out the fact that I'm essentially gluing over these little tubes uh, um, and it'll fill out those gaps so that the PVC still get a good bond. Uh, but it doesn't have to be crazy because of course we'll be coming in over the top with heaps of modeling compound and putty and, and all that sort of stuff. So this will be really locked in when it's all finished, but it's always good to secure things. Now, one thing that we should definitely do before we really start gluing stuff down is just double check all the electrics, make sure no connections have been broken or anything, because if I find that out after everything's glued in, well, up, you know, a certain creek without a particular boating piece of equipment. So, uh, let's jump into, first I'll hack this away and get everything set down and I'll glue in the smoke rig and then we'll do a second uh, electrics test and uh, just double check everything and glue the crap out of it. Alright, let's jump into it. Okay, I'm getting pretty excited. This looks absolutely awesome. Um, it doesn't actually come up that well on camera yet, uh, but when it's all rigged up, I think I should be able to get a couple of really nice graded shots for you guys, but it looks really sick in person. Uh, everything's glued in, everything's secured, I've plumbed our piping down and I've also run the electrics down as well. And uh, the, the colour change uh, selection for the central LEDs, uh, I've made that accessible as well on the side. So if I want to turn the flames green or purple or blue for a bit of a gag, I still can. Um, obviously all of my tubing is still loose, um, but let's just have a little look at the smoke just in general. Obviously this is in the rigged positions, but let's have a push of the button. Oh, oh. Wow, that is pretty awesome. When all of those are plumbed in at the base of the flames and, and you know, they're coming up through the LEDs, I mean, you can really see they get the glimmer of the, uh, of the LEDs as they fly up. That's really fucking exciting. Okay, cool. So, let's get all this out of the way. So, what's next? Next, we're going to uh, start and sculpt back all of this hill and just get that kind of, you know, all covered, cover all of this in, make sure we keep this guy loose. I'm also going to grab uh, one more piece of tubing and just make an extra smoke uh, section, just an extra smoke tube to match with this light so that uh, the little campfire in the orc camp can also have a little bit of smoke. Uh, you know, they're cooking some food while they're assaulting Minas Tirith. Um, and that should be pretty sweet. Then from there, uh, finish off the hill, block all of this out. These aren't glued in yet. Uh, they're just sitting on top. Uh, then we'll kind of secure those in and sculpt down to the edges of the flames and we'll basically lock these in with the putty as we sculpt in. I'm not actually going to glue them down on the gels, uh, which you can see are just underneath at the moment. They're tacked in with some hot glue just to keep them there, but it'll all get locked in by the sculpting process, which is pretty cool because it means we don't have to go crazy with glues. The only reason I really... Uh, the only reason I put down some of the liquid nails underneath this conduit tubing was actually just to help strengthen the board, more of a, of a strengthening thing. Uh, but this is going to be a really nice solid piece of infrastructure when it's all finished. Then from there, we'll move on to sculpting the rest of the board and uh, doing all of our kind of landscape stuff and then we'll start getting into things like the orc camp and the hills and the, the dead kill and all of the corpses. So, we're making good progress, this is looking awesome, let's get into sculpting this hill.
All right, so I've created a false floor just using some uh, foam core board just to go over the top of all the electrical components. Not only so that I don't have to fill this whole thing with putty because then it will get really heavy, but also it means that uh, all those kind of electrical connections aren't going to get fucked with as I'm applying all the structural surface. So now what I'm going to do is just use classic kind of multi-purpose filler, uh, mix that up and, and really start to sculpt all of this in. Obviously we want to cover everything that's there, but we also want to start to create these these ideas of the dugout trenches that kind of rise up and dig down as if the, the orcs have kind of ploughed them out and just dumped all of the dirt around because they're just trying to dig these trenches and kind of light them on fire as quickly as possible. So uh, yeah, I'll start kind of covering that section and then we'll start to build up and really sculpture the rock face and then work in towards the flames to make a really nice kind of cool broken up texture all around the base of the fire. One of the key sections of this phase is how we kind of sculpt the slope of this trench because obviously we don't want to uh, obscure our little smoke channels but we do want to kind of uh, come down into the fire um, and, and really sort of start to build this mound up. So I'm just kind of working in gradually getting closer and closer um, leveling out all this flat stuff around it and then starting to really kind of pull back these, uh, these banks and, and bring material in small amounts at a time. So that's all of our filler down. As you can see, it's starting to look really cool. It's gonna be great when it's completely meshed with the board and the rest of the board is starting to look contoured as well. There is a further layer of detail to go down. Uh, obviously, all of our rock work and texture, but also there's gonna be some coals in and around the fire on that last sort of translucent bit of plastic that we can see, but I'll come back and do that all later once I finish contouring all of the rest of the board. So for our section of paved road, we're just going to use the exact same techniques as when we made the first section of road moving through the causeway forts. I've measured out where the road is going to go on this board so it tessellates perfectly with that first 2x4 section when they're all set up in the 6x8. So we should have a really nice long section of road that lines up nicely. Uh, so we'll just grab our wood putty, uh, roll that out with our rolling pin, uh, which is now PVC piping because I don't know where my rolling pin's gone. Uh, we'll roll that out on here on our plastic sheeting, uh, get that nice and thin and then just use a steel ruler to kind of push away the excess and measure out a 9 centimeter wide strip. We'll transfer that strip over to the board, we'll probably have to do a couple of smaller strips and join them up and then once they're all there we'll come through and roll up a storm with our gorgeous Green Stuff World pavement roller uh, which just puts in such a fantastic pattern. It's going to look awesome in a really long section. Now the only sort of thing to be concerned about uh, is because we're making such a longer section of road we have to make sure that the wood putty doesn't start drying or going hard uh, in earlier sections so I'll, I'll try and work relatively fast get it all down quickly and then just do sort of one slow process rolling through the whole board uh, and as always uh, make sure you put some PVA underneath the wood putty because it doesn't really have much adhesion to cure to flat surfaces uh, so we really need to glue that down. And then we'll come in with a bit of wood putty and a bit, a bit of uh, multi-purpose filler and a bit of tile grout and start to blend that in with the rest of the board as we do the rest of the other board texturing and blending process and then we'll have a really nice looking road. So I'm going to jump straight into it.
Alright, so laying down that road was actually a real pain. The first three quarters of it came down really easily and then I completely forgot to account for the mounds that I'd made for the trenches out of multi-purpose filler. So as I was rolling my pavement, I realised I, I couldn't keep rolling because I was kind of going bumping up over the lump and uh, it was very painful. I had to kind of redo it several times. But it's all done uh, and it's curing. So that's going to take three or four hours to fully cook off. So what I'm going to do while that's drying is start to work on all the other bits around the board and start shaping those sort of elements and then as we move through the board that stuff should be cured and we can blend that in as well. So uh, the kind of bigger elements that we're going to focus on uh, are the uh, rocky outcrops and hills uh, which uh, are going to kind of be used to sort of break up the flat plains and, and have, have a little bit of vertical difference as well but like I said before still keeping that flat surface even if it's on a bit of an angle so that we can you know glue corpses down onto it easily. So we're going to have one big central hill uh, with some rocky outcrops and then just maybe a couple of little outcroppings and small sloping surfaces dotted throughout the board. So I've just got here some more extruded polystyrene. This is actually the chunks that I cut out when we dug up our trenches, which we can see on here. And we're going to use a couple of these to make a, a sort of big central shape, kind of a bit of a wonky oval. Uh, and then what I've got here are some uh, rocky outcroppings from the Woodland Scenics rock moulds. Uh, so these are just uh, cast in plaster, uh, the same hydrostone that I use for our first arts moulds. And it's all the same process, so I'll link that moulding process down in the description below. Uh, the Woodland Scenics moulds are just like, they're a vulcanised rubber mould that you pour the plaster into, you know, wait 20 minutes, it cooks off and then peel it out. They're really great. They do a whole bunch of different sizes, uh, but I've just collected all the small um, moulds sort of that I have, all these different little rocky shapes. And what we'll do is we'll just have a few of these kind of joining together and sort of forming a bit of a rocky surface on the side of the hill, probably uh, creating some cool corners and shapes like that. And then we'll come in with some multi-purpose filler and we'll really blend all of those different rock molds together and blend them into the hill itself. Uh, and then so we'll have a couple on each sort of corner and then in the center it'll all just be sort of smooth grass that will uh, kind of shape and, and cut away with our scalpel blade and then sort of sand back as well. So it's just a really gentle gradient down into the, uh, the main section of the board. So no big sort of crazy climb climbing sections, just a couple of little rocky outcrops, just for a bit of detail as well, that kind of grey stone helps to break out the green and then all the corpses as well. Uh, so yeah, it should add uh, just a little bit of variation to the board that, uh, you know, is, is easy on the eye but also works well for gameplay because it's, you know, big chunk in the centre, some stuff for combat to flow around, you can trap units against the rocky outcropping, so you know, it provides a little bit for gameplay as well. So, I'm going to jump into marking out this middle kind of hill section and then I'll start to carve that back with our scalpel blade, then we'll glue on a few all the rocky outcroppings and really start to shape the hill then we'll bring the hill onto the board itself and start using multi-purpose filler to really sculpt the board and uh, bring the hill into the board and blend it all together. So I smashed up some foam and just roughed out whereabouts our rocky outcroppings are gonna go. I've just kinda of used the uh, angles of my cuts to sort of support the rock faces so they're gonna be sitting the right way. I've got this one central one and just a little rocky guy over here as well. So now what we'll do is just PVA glue all of that down and then come back in with our multi-purpose filler. Uh, mix that up as we always do, just with a bit of water and then that'll turn into that kinda of nice gritty paste and then we'll come in and smooth all of those blends moving right up to the top of the rock faces and getting in underneath the rock faces as well because we're going to blend the bottom of those plaster pieces uh, by essentially just pushing grass all the way up into the rock so we're just going to uh, kind of put in the bedding for that grass work to go down and it should blend in quite nicely. I will kind of contour the top of this hill a little bit so it slants down a bit more, shave that back a bit so it's just a nice smooth gradient similar to what I've done over here except with this one I'll probably bulk that out a little bit more so it goes a little bit longer and a little bit flatter. We should be able to have a few beautiful corpses just sitting on the top of those hills.
So the rocky outcroppings are looking really great. The uh, multi-purpose filler has blended them really nicely into the board, and I think they're the perfect balance between, you know, enough to make the center of the board interesting, but not so dominating that they're going to ruin the whole kind of flow of our central field in the middle of the battlefield. I love that this one's pretty central as well, because if we reuse this board for other missions with central objectives, it's just a nice point of interest, and it just takes away from the big flat expanse that we have elsewhere. Cool, all right, well now it's time to start jumping into getting our corpses ready to be glued down onto the board. So the image that really got my creative juices flowing when I first read Jake Clare's incredible scenario from the Lord of the Rings army book was the idea of trying to capture this scene of the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, you know, at its height, at its most frenetic, where there's horses and elephants and everybody just going everywhere, and it's, it's you know, a real scene of death and carnage, and what effectively is one of the biggest moments in Lord of the Rings history. And when players are playing on this board, making them feel like, you know, they're a part of something bigger, and that the models they have are a part of this huge army and, and part of a huge event. And I knew kind of off the bat that the big element to really capture that scale was to have the board covered with the litter of war, you know, corpses of Rohan and elephants and orcs and Easterlings and discarded shields and swords and banners and spears and, and all that kind of paraphernalia of, of carnage and war and death. So obviously it's a huge board, 6x8, so to have enough corpses to really capture the scale and the feeling of that carnage on the battlefield was always going to be a bit of a tricky challenge. I knew kind of off the top of my head that the Mumakil base uh, has some incredible detailed work by the Perry brothers, I think. We've got, you know, dead Rohan on there, some dead orcs as well, dead Moran, and um, it's, you know, a really lovely scene with some beautiful dead horse sculpts. Then, you know, there is uh, a kind of a range of different uh, casualty models that are available. Obviously, that really rare casualty kit from 2012, I think, which I don't have, but just there's also uh, some, you know, dead Easterlings in the Easterling kit and dead orcs in the Treebeard kit. Uh, there's uh, uh, Gothmog's base has uh, a dead ranger on it, and one of the Witch King or Felbeast bases has uh, another that dead uh, Rohan on it so I kind of put together all my resources that I had between me and my mates and I went okay we can gather all these things together and that's great but it's still not going to be that many so I knew from the outset that I was going to have to make molds of these items and reproduce them on mass to try and uh, get the scale that we wanted because I mean there's the yeah I'm, I'm not going to buy 20 elephants so I can put 20 of these bases through the field that's insane so before we go any further down this conversation we certainly have to address the elephant in the room. Best unplanned pun ever. Uh, and that's recasting. So, um, obviously I'm 100% against recasting. It's a blight on this community and, uh, and I certainly don't want to be seen to be promoting that in any way. Uh, I, you know, intellectual property stuff aside to be to be reproducing somebody else's models um, it's you know it's really a shit thing to do and I'm certainly not in the business of that at all uh, but I think it's um pretty unrealistic for, you know, I, I want to build an incredible battlefield that's 6x8 covered with dead elephants. If Games Workshop thinks I'm going to buy 25 elephants just so that I can have that beautiful scene that I want, they're crazy. But, um, you know, so for terrain purposes, I'm okay with it personally uh, for, you know, doing it for my own stuff, but I certainly wouldn't, you know, be selling any of this gear or going down that road at all. It's really damaging to the community and the hobby, um, and, uh, you know, I don't want to be seen to be promoting that or, or even teaching people the means to do that. That. So I'm not even going to go in depth on the process that I use to kind of make my corpses uh, with any sort of seriousness um, because, yeah, it's, it's just not something that I want to be seen to be promoting. Um, uh, I, of course, you know, by taking molds of these bases, uh, yes, I am technically reproducing Games Workshop property. Um, certainly not for its intended use. I'm not making bases. I'm making a, a big terrain piece. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm not producing models that can be played with that are, you know, models that would be bought to, you know, uh, be, be part of an army and, and you know, that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not stealing money in any case. Yeah. So I'm trying to just make a really gorgeous terrain piece and, uh, and, you know, capture the feeling of an incredible moment so we can have some amazing games. So I think deep in their heart, their lawyers might not agree, but I think they'd be cool with it. So I'm cool with it. So essentially what we've done is I've uh, grabbed all of those corpses and put them together in two silicon molds. Um, you know, there's obviously the bread and butter is coming from our Mumakil base, and then we've got our dead Easterlings, uh, just some shields that I've collected, different kind of swords and shields, 
uh, and we've got the the other Rohan cavalry from uh, the Fell Beast and then Goth Monks Gondor troops as well and then a few more some uh, Warriors of the Dead shields as well um, even though you know they're not going to be painted up as those they're just kind of really nice generic shields and some more swords and bits and pieces Dolanroth too and so what I've done is I've used uh, a couple of different types of resin to make uh, molds of all of those pieces and that's given me uh, you know a whole bunch of stuff but we've got to be really clever in the way that we use them especially the Mumakil base because if we just go you know here's four horsemen then plonk 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 we'll just have all these ovals that look exactly the same so what I've done with a lot of them is I've broken them up into their individual components their individual horses or you know dead orcs and that way we can move it all around and mix it around combine it with you know some of these single dead Easterling troops and uh, the other single Rohan horse from the uh, Fell Beast base, mix that all up and get, you know, a really great variety across the board, even though we're essentially reusing the same four horses and same seven infantry over and over again. The other thing, of course, is that when we paint them, we'll be painting all the horses different colours, painting the armour, you know, making it look different, making it look nice and varied, so we really capture the feel of that battlescape. The other thing that I should mention is that these models are all a flat plane with extruded detail, so the process that you use to reproduce these uh, uh, you know, making this kind of single face mold and, and kind of pouring resin straight into it is completely different from the process that you would use to create proper, you know, wargaming miniatures that are full 360 with detail. So even if someone was to try and copy my uh, techniques here, it's never going to work to, you know, recast or, or reproduce actual, you know, tabletop gaming miniatures. So just a little caveat. Now, of course, the other thing that we have, the other incredibly exciting corpse is our dead Mumakil, this incredibly beautiful little sculpt. And this is done by uh, Adam Brukas from Small Scenics in the UK and uh, I picked up three of these bad boys uh, and they're just, they're really fun and it's going to be so cool, particularly because they're so bulky, um, you know, a big nice chunk of detail on the battlefield, really bring it to life and, and be part of that real chaos of war. So we're going to have one permanently dressed into the battlefield and then uh, I've got another two from Adam as well, which we're going to still paint up and everything, but they're going to be dynamic elements that when elephants die during the game, we'll drop those elephants in which is gonna be pretty cool so I'm super excited about that huge shout out to Adam I've got all his uh, links and stuff down in the description below so you can go and check out all his models I can't remember off the top of my head how much they cost but I'll put that all down in the description um, now in terms of uh, our painting scheme so uh, the first thing we're going to do is prime the crap out of everything, get a really good prime on it. Now, I'm sure a lot of you guys have probably worked with resin or for Forge World resin before, but uh, it's not quite the same as plastic. There's a few important steps you need to take uh, when you're working with any type of resin. Obviously, you give everything a wash and soapy water, let that dry, and then what we're going to do is prime it with a, a clear matte varnish. Uh, and what that does is that just seals the resin and creates a layer that our primed paint uh, can adhere to, and it's not going to flake off. It's going to, you know, Particularly something that's terrain, the models are going to be standing all over, that's really important. So uh, we'll hit it with a, uh, a flat clear. I'm using Tamiya today, my first time playing with Tamiya paint, so I'm pretty excited. Then once that's dried, it'll take about an hour to dry, we're going to hit it with uh, essentially what's going to be our prime. Now I'm not doing grey, I'm not doing black, I'm not doing white. I'm going to do a brown because uh, it makes the most sense, right? I've got a lot of leather, I've got a lot of horses, I've got horse hair, I've got, you know, kind of rustic looking armour, I've got dirt and mud. So brown is a great place to be able to work up and back from uh, to make things darker or to make things lighter you know we can wash it down to get really dark looking chocolatey horses or you know dry brush and highlight it up with our airbrush and all those sorts of goodness so uh, it's a great place to work from because it's going to save us a lot of time so first up is the clear matte varnish then we've got the brown primer one hour later then we'll put down you know all our base coats and stuff and eventually we'll hit it with a semi gloss as well which is gonna help with all our washes and other kind of detail highlight finishes. But we're gonna get into the painting scheme further down the track. First of all, let's get this stuff all primed and then we're gonna dress it into the board, uh, you know, glue it all down and kind of get all the rubble and dirt and mud and blend it all into the board. And once it's blended, then we'll start to actually paint the models themselves because that way they're gonna look a lot more part of the board if we're painting them as we paint the board. So, exciting times. That's been a lot of talking from me. Let's go and get these guys all primed and then we can get ready to get them into the board.
So that's all the corpses primed, and now we come to probably one of the funnest parts of this build, and that's laying out all of our corpses in this big scene of death and assembling our graveyard. So uh, one of the kind of key things to remember is that we want to make sure that uh, in none of the repeated forms are too close together. I mean, it's essentially like a big jigsaw puzzle as we kind of work out the best combination to fit in all the, the bigger stuff and, and the smaller pieces as well so that nothing looks like, you know, it's the same dead horse over and over again or the same, you know, orc. Uh, we really want to make sure it looks nice and varied. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll start by putting down uh, the big sections of Mumakil base and making sure they're at different kind of angles and orientations and spread out across the board and then we'll start to break up those forms by bringing in the smaller corpses, our Easterlings, our, all the stuff off the Gothmog and, and Fell Beast bases uh, and our shields and all that kind of battle paraphernalia as well and hopefully we should be able to create a real patchwork of uh, this big big battle that doesn't look like nothing's being repeated. Then we'll glue that all down just by chucking PVA on the back of them and gluing them straight to the foam and then we'll start to blend them into the board itself using a bit of our multi-purpose filler and some wood putty and kind of blend that all into the board itself. I've also got my heat gun here so as we start to contour the board if I want to make some bits a little bit lower I can melt the foam away just like we did in the last couple of videos and, and help sort of contour the board particularly over near the edges where we're blending with those other Ramus boards that are really kind of lumpy uh, and kind of bringing that all together and then we should have a really nice scene that's gonna be pretty cool to play on I think. Uh, we'll also have a few other things to blend as well while we're doing that process stuff like this road and also beginning to level out the orc camp uh, and kind of get but essentially by the end of this process we want all the corpses down and the board to be kind of completely happy and ready and, and like a landscape ready to take paint and grass and then we'll move on to our orc camp and then it's on to painting so we're reaching the pointy end let's jump into it So I've just finished leveling out and landscaping the board with the multi-purpose fill and it's looking fantastic. I had to uh, level out a few of our moulds in places because as they've been glued down they've had quite a bit of discrepancy but most of them have been fine. Uh, there is still a little lip between them but we're going to take care of that lip in our next layer. Now the surface of the Palinor fields uh, should be pretty kind of churned up and full of hoof prints and mud and grass so to kind of begin that detail layer uh, we're going to go in now and cover the whole board with PVA and just drizzle on some tile grout absolutely everywhere. Everywhere. Tile grout's great because it's not only an adhesive itself, but it soaks up the moisture of the PVA and creates all these great textures, uh, and then it cooks off really hard and really strong, so it's a great gaming surface for us to then put paint and grass on top of. So once I sprinkle uh, our tile grade down onto the PVA, I've just got a little bamboo skewer here that's been cut off at the end, so it just looks like the imprint of a horse's hoof, and then I'll just take that and poke it into our tile grout texture, and that should give us some really lovely horsey hoof imprints uh, all over the board to kind of hint at that churned up stake. So I'm going to get that detail down and then once that's down we should be able to start moving into our orc camp because the groundwork for that will be done as well. So as you can see the watered down PVA is really important because it gives you a great flow rate for when you're uh, pouring it through and kind of spreading it all around the uh, corpses but it also gives moisture for the grout to kind of soak up and, and help that really cook off and, and set nice and rock hard. Uh, make sure you leave kind of honestly a, quite a fair amount of moisture on the board because it, it really allows the grout to, to soak it all up and bond uh, so don't worry about it you know essentially being a bit of a swimming lake really. Um, uh, when we're uh, when we're putting it on, you just got to be careful. Anywhere you put moisture, it's going to become covered with grout. Uh, so try not to spill any on your horses. Uh, uh, and if you do, 
just grab yourself some paper towel and, and try and pull it back. You know, occasionally it'll squirt up somewhere. It, it's really like the the horse flesh and the corpses and stuff. But also, you don't have to be too concerned about like don't be too crazy because. This stuff's going to be covered with mud, you know, these aren't beautiful, pretty corpses. There's other horses and warriors riding and running over them, churning up mud everywhere. So, you know, if a bit of mud gets all over your dudes, just, you know, ride with it and, uh, and then you can just paint them covered in mud and it should look quite good. So, let's get our grout down. Um, so I've just got my coloured grout here, it's just a grey, doesn't matter what kind of grout I use. So I've just got a little kitchen sifter here, which just helps for um, application. Drop it in, a lot of it will fall straight through, but you just get the sifter for a little bit of extra control. Don't worry about covering your moulds, that'll all just back straight off later. You can see I'm being really liberal with it. And then once you've got your kind of base coverage down with your sifter, uh, just so that you, you know you don't want it to look too even, you want it to look pretty modelled, you can just go and drop some in by hand and, and that'll really kind of break up that overly smooth surface. Then once you're happy with your coverage, you just grab your vacuum. I did start using my little hand vac, but just get a big vacuum, it makes it a hell of a lot easier. And what you want to do is just run your vac over all of the dry stuff uh, try not to pick up any of the wet gross grout, otherwise it's going to get stuck up inside your nozzle. Uh, but, oh, I guess you could use a wet dry vac as well, but this is just my household vacuum cleaner, so I don't want to mess it up or the missus will be mad. Uh, and then we just come in and we just pull off all of the dry stuff. Uh, just, you've got to be kind of careful that you don't uh, pull liquid up from the pools up onto the dry models. That's something that you're not really looking for. So yeah, just focus on, you know, isolating horse, horse, man, man, and it doesn't have to come off all the base of the mold, just, just your hero elements. Pick out little shields, pick out corpses, and, uh, and get vacuuming. So the tile grout layer is finished and it was actually a bit of a bitch of a process. I thought that I could kind of just get my way out of trouble by kind of dumping grout everywhere to blend these resin moulds in and that really didn't work. So I had to go back around each and every single mould around every edge with multi-purpose filler and really blend them all into the board. And as soon as I did that it started looking great and all of this kind of grout layer is going to look really fantastic. I think it's starting to soak up the moisture and it's going to probably dry you know right through till the morning and as it soaks up more and more of that moisture will kind of ball up and give it even more dope texture. So I'm, I mean, it's looking pretty promising. I'm pretty excited to see what we get in the morning. Once this is all dried, we'll come in and we'll just give it a big prime and really seal it in with spray paint and lock it all down. And then we can dive into painting it, which is going to be absolutely awesome. But that's going to wrap us up for today. I think it's been a, enough of a journey checking us out this far. And we'll come back with another video uh, where we hit all of these gorgeous little models and start to paint this board and then bring in all our static grass layers as well, uh, which is going to be really exciting. Lots of cool stuff. Obviously there's, uh, there's a lot of models here so I'm not going to be painting it on my own. We're going to have a few friends come and uh, give us a hand which is going to be really exciting because I'd be here till Christmas 2020 if I tried to paint this all on my own. There's a lot of Rohan and a lot of Orcs and a lot of Easterlings to uh, get my way through so that should be really fun as well. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. If you have let us know, give us a like and if you've got any questions or feedback drop them down in the comments section below. Uh, if you're new around here feel free to subscribe. We'd love to have you as part of the community and if you want to support the channel you can head on over to our patreon there's a link down in the description and for just a five dollar pledge per month you get to join our patreon discord as i've been working on this board i've just been posting photos non-stop to the discord and chatting with the guys about different things and we're building a really cool little community over there and it allows you to kind of be a part of the process and not just be waiting for you know videos which can come out you know sometimes one a month when i'm doing big builds like this so it's just another way for you guys to get involved and be a part of my process uh which is really fun we're really enjoying doing that so check out all the Patreon details down in the description and uh, yeah thank you so much for watching guys the next video should be out pretty soon so I'm going to do these back to back and just keep on working and, and edit them and then uh, upload them while I'm away in Europe so um, that should be pretty cool you shouldn't have to wait too long to see all these corpses looking absolutely juicy and painted so in the meantime I'm Loki this has been Zorbazorb Gaming thank you so much for watching we will see you next time and keep on SPG Gaming guys cheers <laughs>